Thank you, Don, very much. I, I would presume everyone will be able to see the connection I'm going to be making between um, our, our, our earthly families and then our church family. And uh, this, this particularly rings to me, as uh, most of you know, my mother's health has been failing rather dramatically over the last nine months, and she's moving to uh, a red button on Tuesday, and so looking forward to that. And, uh, and, and I have a brother, of course, one that lives, well, both live out of state, and so this has been left up to me primarily to take care of this, and, and, uh, and it's been very exhausting, and I'm not complaining about that, but one of the reasons I do it is, to be quite honest, other than the fact that Beth is my mother, but I am compelled to do this because Scripture says, Honor thy father and mother. This is my moral responsibility to take care of my mother, and certainly when my father is dying, to take care of my father as well. And uh, so that's some of the background. Now, let me share this thing about Corbin because it's a little confusing. What happened is this. It's quite simple. Uh, scripture says you're supposed to take care of your mother and father. And there's a period after. There are no exceptions. And the reason it's supposed to take care of them, certainly back then, is uh, uh, when they would get older, they wouldn't have any money, and they would just simply, somebody had to take care of them. And we didn't, they didn't have the health care industry that we have today, and so they would have been in bad shape. Well, the priests came up, some priests came up with a tradition, it's called Corbin, that <clears throat> what you could do is uh, you could sidestep taking care of your parents, if instead of giving that money to your parents, you would give it to the temple. And so, and that way you wouldn't have to take care of your mother and father. So that's behind that. <clears throat> that said, I mentioned this before, probably wouldn't, well, certainly won't resonate with probably anybody under 40, but, but that's all right. We'll, we'll educate as well as uh, inspire. Following World War I, now, Ralph can't remember World War I, but uh, following World War I in 1918, a term arose among the literati, and particularly with, uh, let's see, be Ernest Hemingway and uh, Gertrude Stein, and I think she's the one that, that coined it. Um, and anyway, a, a, a term arose to explain the social conditions uh, facing post-World post War I America. And the term that was coined, if you will, was the lost generation. And it referred to a new America that was emerging from its agricultural underpinnings to one more decidedly urban and industrial. And not only that, you had this, uh, the returning of all these soldiers from uh, obviously a hideous experience uh, on the Western Front and coming back somewhat disillusioned and coming back um, to an America that was now different than, than what it was prior to their leaving, just in that about eight to 10 year period. And not only this, uh, now, because of certain academics, challenges uh, were being made to the old philosophies and even the traditional meanings uh, for interpreting scripture uh, were being uh, um, assaulted. And so what was happening to many Americans is this was a time of great confusion uh, for, for many, many people. But of equal importance, I think, was the beginnings of the fracturing of the family as the basic unit for binding society together. Now, I look at my Korean friends, this is exactly what is happening in Korea. This, the, up till about 1980, Korea was, was really, really bound together by the family unit. Just really, really tightly. And now it's happening is you're studying in America and you're, you may not go back, you know? You may marry a, 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 an American, see?
And so what's happening in Korea is where, as a matter of fact, uh, began happening in the United States about 100 years ago. And the family unit now was beginning to just get little cracks in it. And America was undergoing the beginnings of an upheaval that would be fully realized after World War II. And it would take about 60 more years for that realization to finally take place. Now a lot of, and again, I hate doing this because a lot of people didn't grow up in Indiana, and a lot of people uh, here are not over 40. But even when I was a little boy, uh, the family unit was pretty much intact. But by the 1950s, the late 1950s, the family unit and the immediate family uh, bondings, that would be aunts and uncles, grandpa and grandma, uh, they now were finally under direct assault. And the soldiers were coming back from the Pacific, and this is really interesting, that a lot of them stayed in the West Coast. And so you can go to L.A., for example, and you can go to San Fernando Valley, those of you who are familiar, I know uh, Evelyn's very familiar with it, and uh, before the war, th there, it was just a valley 20 miles long and about seven or eight miles wide, very beautiful, and hardly anybody lived there. Two pointer, about four million people who live in it now, in this little valley. That's where a lot of your Western movies were made, you know, back 50 years ago in this valley. Well, no, not anymore. See, these soldiers came back and they settled in Panorama City and Encino and uh, uh, Reseda and Van Nuys and all these little villages, and that's all they were. Uh, in San Fernando Valley, now they all connected. And so the soldiers instead of coming back to Iowa, back to Indiana, a lot of them stayed there. Or if they were coming back from the Eastern Front, maybe they stayed in Florida. And that was the beginning of this. And uh, so, uh, and even then when they came home, a lot of the time, uh, and not to, to, to be disparaging, but you, let's say you go to war and you come home to Olytic, and what are you going to do? Well, what are you going to do in Olytic, Indiana? Well, what are you going to do in Steinsville, Indiana? What are you going to do in Waldron, Indiana? Now, let me tell you, all these are little villages that have their own post office, they have their own uh, uh, general store, they have their own high schools, they have their own grade schools. Um, uh, they had their own barber shop, whoops, barber shops. They had all of that. It was a contained little, beautiful, little, wonderful towns. But when people came back, people were dead. The towns were disintegrating. There was no place to go. There was no employment. And so what happened is the soldiers and their new brides, they didn't stay. And they moved. The ties um, that once would bind are now but all gone. And those who are over 40 know exactly what I'm talking about. And in a very real sense, in this age that we're in now, which is an, a really interesting age, we now are, are we, meaning Americans, we're now another a, a lost generation. Something big is happening, and I don't know how this is going to play its way out. Something big is happening, and society is, is suffering this great upheaval, and uh, we'll see. I want to lay that aside there just a second and recall that during October, I, I preached at length about love, and specifically that authentic love is experienced within the fellowship of Christians. Now, that fellowship doesn't necessarily have to take place in a specific building. It can take place in a prayer group. It can play, take place over the phone when you're talking to somebody about their spiritual needs. It can take place in the hospital. But it's in that context of the fellowship. Remember the Greek word is koinonia. In that koinonia that we discover authentic love. And that love is agape love, which is forgiving, which is serving love, uh, which is love, which is affection in action and displayed in the way we take care of each other. That Love is experienced then within the family of God. That's God's family. And we're part of God's family. 
Now speaking of that sacred family, we here at UP um, continue a tradition regarding God's family that used to be quite common throughout America, certainly in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and uh, mid, up to the mid-50s, I would say. And, and back then, it was expected to have family reunions. And these reunions were not once a year uh, events, um, but rather they, they might have taken place once a month. Because everybody was within, you know, certainly a half a tank of gas, if not, if not closer than that, to the immediate family. And this ensured then that the, uh, this ensured then the social stability uh, of that family unit, the greater family unit, and then it galvanized the bonds between all the members. And I, I, I know you know what I'm talking about, because that's what we used to do. I don't do it anymore, do we, Nancy? Don't do it anymore. Okay? And so what happens then is the way we would do it, and, and most everybody understands this, that the focal point of this gathering then would be a pitch in meal. And then people would, you know, obviously, you know, grandma would make the, what, the noodles, noodles yeah, the noodles, and, <laughs> and so they'd bring that green bean casserole, and there'd be some pies brought in, and some fried chicken, and, and you'd sit around, and that, that's what we would do, and share that. And it would always begin with prayer, and then following the meal, it would always, always the kids well, would, would be go off and play somewhere, and the adults then would sit around and share their lives with each other. So this reunion was a time of sharing and repairing and caring the, uh, the family unit. And, and not only the family unit, the immediate family unit, you know, and the, and the aunts and uncles and all that. Now today, because our biological families are scattered, the, uh, the, the new family, that, is, that has been with us all the time, but people are beginning to discover it now. Uh, a new family has come along that provides um, nurturing information, comfort, challenges, and places for play, and it is called the fellowship. It's called the church. And our fellowship, drawing on the traditions of the saints and drawing on the, the scriptural mandates that we have, and drawing upon the wealth of information that we, have read, that we have received from our parents and our grandparents regarding the idea of reunions and coming together and sharing our lives with each other, what this fellowship does, and many too, to be sure, uh, once a month we gather as a family, as a time of reunion, and we come around a table and we begin this, uh, this moment of sharing with each other with prayer. Then what we do is we enjoy a meal, and then following the meal, the children go off and play for a while. And those of us who are not playing with the children, we sit around the table downstairs during fellowship hour, and we share with each other, and we talk about things that are important. And we say, Eugenia, when are you coming back? Mm -hmm. Or we say, uh, Young Kyung, you're gonna, not, you're gonna be just fine. And we take it, when you go to Alan Pease and say, Alan, thank you for the spectacular job that you did uh, with Niaka. And, and, and that's what we do. And we renew our, our, our friendships and renew our fellowship and we behave like Jesus Christ, taking care of one another. And some of us will see Vicky's baby back there and we'll pinch the little baby like that. <laughs> and we'll go, wake up, little baby. Say, we'll do that. And that's called the well, that's what I did with your kids, and they, oh, that's the problem, I'm sorry. <laughs> this meal together is called Holy Communion, called the Eucharist. And that's what we're going to do in, in just a moment. And it is in this Holy Communion um, that we become centered again. And by that I mean where we center on Jesus Christ, and we center on what we're supposed to be about as Christians and we center on loving one another, and we center on taking care of our family members and let them take care of us. Holy Communion then is where the lost can once again be found. Holy Communion then is where the lonely can be comforted. 
Holy Communion then is where the troubled, troubled can be given hope, where the broken can be healed. And it's in the fellowship then, this grand family gathering.